All right, here we are for another thrilling video. Uh, for this, I want to talk about not so much a radical function, but when you square root any function, what happens, especially to the graph, visualizing what happens to a graph when you square root the function. Um, and so I'll get straight into these points. So if f of x is just some function, could be a line, could be a quadratic, could be anything, the square root of that function really just means we take uh, the points x comma y and we square root the outputs of the function. Squaring the output is same as square rooting the y. So in mapping notation, the square root of a function can be shown as x comma y maps onto x comma root y. Right, y representing the output, out, the output of function f. Uh, so where are these two graphs the same? Where is the graph of f of x and root f of x the same? But they're the same anywhere you square root a number and doesn't change. So how can you square root a number and nothing changes? Well, that happens if you square root 1 or 0. The square root of 1 is 1. The square root of 0 is 0. So anytime a function has an output of 1 or output of 0, nothing changes. And so we can say this as they are invariant anywhere the f of x equals 0 or anywhere f of x equals 1. Uh, and again, f of x representing the y coordinate. So I could write down here below anywhere your original function has a y coordinate equal to 0 or a y coordinate equal to 1. Um, keep in mind, you can't square root negative numbers, or the square root of a negative number is an imaginary number. And we're still dealing with just real numbers in this course. So anytime your f of x has an output that's negative, the square root no longer exists. And so the graph of root f of x does not exist anywhere that f of x is less than 0. Right? The output, anywhere the output of your function is negative, the square root of that won't exist. Or I could say anywhere that y is less than 0. And lastly, if uh, the output of your function, whatever it is, is between 0 and 1, then the square root of that function will actually be a bit greater than the original function. And so the, then the square root of f of x will be greater than just f of x. And that all comes down to the fact that if you square root a number between 0 and 1, the square root is actually a larger value, is greater than what you started with. But only if you square root a number between 0 and 1. Square root a number less than 0, well, it's, it's imaginary, it's not real. Square root a number more than 1, and it's less than what you started with. All right, so with that said, let's look at these graphs. I got a linear function here. Um, I'm calling it f of x. So I'll just label it right here, y equals f of x. What does the square root of f of x look like? Well, what I'm going to do is focus on a few little pieces separately and then kind of put everything together. So first of all, I want to focus on where this function here and the square root of f of x, which I'll draw in red, are invariant. These two functions are invariant anywhere that f of x equals 0 or 1. Anywhere the output of this line is 0 or 1. So the output. So the output is 0 right here. The output is 1 right here. And so those two points are invariant. I know the square root of f of x is going to go through those two points. What else do I know? Uh, I know that anywhere my function f of x is negative, so this region here, I know that my root of f of x won't exist. So I now know that my function will start right here. I know that's going to become a starting point. OK, so I know it's going to start there. Um, what else do I know? Well, I can, if I want, I can just pick some more points on this line here. For example, I like perfect squares if I'm going to square root them. So let me look at my outputs. Are there any outputs here that are a perfect square? Yeah, right here. Right here, my output is 4. So I might as well use that point there. Uh, the square root of 4 is 2. So I know my square root is going to go through here. So now, not only do I have three points, I know that it starts at that little starting point there. Um, I also know that when my output is between 0 and 1, this region here, uh, and that region there, the outputs of f of x are between 0 and 1, I know the square root of numbers between 0 and 1 are more than what we started with. So I know the square root in here will be a little bit higher, but then it'll be invariant again, and then it has to connect to this dot over here and go on and on and on, and I've got a pretty good quick sketch of what this must look like. And so what I've drawn in red is the square root of f of x. And so I started with the invariant points, picked a few other points that are like a perfect square, easy to deal with, and then kind of connected everything together. All right, let's look at this. This is now g of x in blue. So let me label that. 
Okay, same idea. Start with the invariant points. The invariant points are anywhere that g of x has outputs of 0. So right here and here. I don't know the x-coordinates exactly, but who cares? I can see them. And where the x-coordinate outputs, I mean, are 1. Okay. I know that anywhere my function g is negative, the outputs are negative, that region in blue. I know my square root function will not exist, so I know there's going to be two sort of endpoints here. The function's going to have a little break in the middle. Are there any other perfect squares I can pick? Well, on g of x, uh, for example, 9, output of 9 is right there. So if I kind of follow that straight down, I know that's going to make its way down to 3, so about right here and about right here. I'm just estimating. But now, notice I've really quickly got six points. I know there's a break in the middle. Uh, and let me kind of connect the dots, essentially, with a curve. I know it's got to look something like this. And as well, notice between 0 and 1 on the outputs on y, my square root function was a bit larger. And really quickly, I've sketched a pretty complex thing, the square root of this quadratic function. So it has endpoints, it has this break in the middle. And that's pretty accurate. If you graphed, if you found the equation of g of x and graphed the square root of it in decimals, it would look pretty close to this. OK, what about this? What about the square root of this really, really simple quadratic function? Because this h of x right here, oops, wrong color. I'll label this. Keep in mind, h of x, uh, if you look at the equation, this is actually just x squared. It's the simplest quadratic function. That's it. Invariant points, and where the output is 0 or 1. OK, so notice my quadratic function is never negative. The outputs are never negative. So my square root of this function will always exist. There'll be no breaks. Um, any other nice sort of clean values to look at? Well, let's look at outputs that are perfect squares, like right here and right here. I have outputs that are 4, so the square root of that is going to be here and here. And as well, if you look up, I can even do the same thing for 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So pretty quickly, I get, I now have, what is it, seven points that are forming two perfectly linear line segments. Um, and if I continue, you realize, yeah, these are forming a perfectly straight line. This is not a curve. And if I pick more points, it'll confirm that. So my graph of the square root of h of x sure looks like the absolute value of x. And that's because it is the absolute value of x. So how can, you know, this is the exact same as the absolute value of x. How can I prove that? Well, let me go back to right here. Let me write h of x equals x squared. If I square root that and square root that, the square root of x squared is the exact same as the absolute value of x. And that's because if I, in this order, if I square something first and then square root it, what's going to come out is always positive. For example, let x equal, I don't know, 3. If I take 3 and square it, and then square root it, I get the square root of 9, which is 3. OK, but let's say, what if x is negative 3? Well, then I get negative 3 squared. And then I square root that. Negative 3 squared is still positive 9. And so even if x is negative 3, my output is positive. And so if you take a number and square it, and then square root it, it's the same as the absolute value of x. Um, a lot of people think that these just cancel each other out, and that's only true if you ignore negative numbers, which is not a good idea to ignore half of all numbers. And so this is always correct. If you take a number and square it and then square root it, it's always the same as the absolute value of that. And watch you see that throughout this course. And there's a nice little visual that kind of complements it as well. All right, last one, an upside down parabola. Same idea. Let's look at the invariant points. 0, output, and 1. OK. I'm next. I realize that my function, my square root function, is not going to exist um, where I've highlighted in blue. So my square root function is going to start at negative 3 on the x and end at positive 3. Any other nice coordinates? Well, right up here, how convenient. That vertex is right at 9. That's a perfect square. So it's going to go here. As well, if I look at where output is 4, right here and right here, the square root of 4 is 2. So if I kind of follow those straight down, I know really quickly have seven points. And I can essentially just connect the dots, and I have what looks like a semicircle. And in fact, it is exactly a semicircle. It's exactly the shape of half a circle. 
And so my equation here of the square root of i of x, and I'll label i of x up here, forms a semicircle, forms half a circle of radius 3, which leads me to my very last question, which is a full circle. So what we see here is a full circle um, with radius 4. I want us to try to find the equation of this first by breaking it up into two halves, the top half, which is similar to the last question, and then the bottom half. Then though, I want to see if I can find a way to take that and write it as a single equation. So let's look at the top half. If I compare the top half in yellow to this, uh, if I look right here, this is a semicircle of radius 3. And that was, fine by, that was found by square rooting i of x. So if I look at i of x, what was i of x? i of x is 9 minus x squared, or negative x squared plus 9. Same thing. right? It's a quadratic function opening down, uh, moved tr translated 9 units up with no stretch. If you look at that shape in blue, there's no stretch there. Of these two equations, I kind of like 9 minus x squared better. And so when I have the equation of what's in red, instead of root i of x, I'm going to write it as root 9 minus x squared. So in this case, it's a radius of 4, which means if we thought of a parabola, the vertex would have been 16 units up. Because to get to this point right there, after I square root it, that means the vertex at some point must have been way up here. If we imagine a parabola like before. That was 16 units up. I then square rooted it to get it to 4, which means I know the top half of this must be a quadratic function, which is, actually I'll just go like this. The top half must be the same as minus x squared, a quadratic function flipped up, you know, opening down 16 units up, or 16 minus x squared. The only reason I like the second one a little bit better is I just don't like having negatives in the front. So what I have there is not, you know, 16 minus x squared is not the equation of what's in yellow. That's the equation of the parabola before I square rooted it. And so I need to put a radical over it. What do you see highlighted in yellow? That is the either of these. That is the equation of the top half of the semicircle, which relates quite similar to what you see right here. What you see in red is the square root of 9 minus x squared. Literally, you can see the parabola, 9 minus x squared, that we then square root. We just don't see the parabola anymore here. If that's the top half, the bottom half must be the exact same thing, just reflected vertically. So once I know the top half is that, the bottom half should be pretty simple. The bottom half is just negative root 16 minus x squared. Right? This is the exact same thing as the top, but reflected vertically. So now I have my two equations separately. I have the top half, which I'll write right here, y equals square root. 16 minus x squared, and down here y equals minus the square root of 16 minus x squared. I've said that quickly, but that's not easy what I'm doing. But I've now found the uh, two equations that together make a full circle. But how can I put it together into a single equation? Well, one thing I can do is write it as y equals plus or minus the square root of 16 minus x squared. However, that is still two two equations. When I write this down, y equals plus or minus the square root of 16 minus x squared, that is two equations. It's a lazy way of writing two equations. It's great, but it's still two equations. How can I write it as one equation? Well, I can if I square both sides. If I square both sides, the left-hand side becomes y squared. The right-hand side, which is right now two separate equations, becomes two equations that are the same. If you square positive root 16 minus x squared, you get just 16 minus x squared. If you square minus root 16 minus x squared, you get the exact same thing, because a negative when you square it becomes positive. So when I square both sides, these two equations can be written as 1. And if I take x squared and bring it to the other side just to get my variables together, I get x squared plus y squared equals 16. And that there is a single equation that is the equation of the full circle. This is the equation of a circle, not just the top half, the whole thing, a circle of radius 4. Uh, and that 4, notice, I can see if I rewrite my equation as x squared plus y squared equals 4 squared. Now. I'm getting a little bit ahead of what we need to talk about. 
Um, but I will say, first of all, notice I have come up with an equation, a single equation that represent a full circle. This circle here is not a function. It fails the vertical line test. And so it's not possible to write an equation for a circle as something solved for y as a single equation. Remember, plus or minus means two separate equations. But it doesn't mean you can't write an equation. And I guarantee if you take the time to go into Desmos and type one of these equations, you will see a perfectly formed circle of radius 4. It's kind of weird, these equations. They're not solved for x or y. But they're also kind of pleasantly simple. In fact, if you look at them, especially the second one, it sure kind of looks like the Pythagorean theorem x squared plus y squared equals 4 squared kind of sounds like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And that's because it really is. Uh, essentially, this is now connecting circles to the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem connects us back to triangles. And we start to see how trigonometry can get complex in this course because we st can start to see how the Pythagorean theorem, which is usually thought about with right triangles, actually connects back to circles which connects back to rotations, and we'll see this more in trigonometry. All I want to say right now is that this part here I did at first is the most important part, and realizing how if you take a quadratic function like 16 minus x squared and find the square root of it, you create these parts of circles. Lots of ground we covered here quickly, um, but I'm done all I need to talk about. So let's take a deep breath.